Hello Church, and welcome to our virtual worship service for Sunday, June 21st, 2020. This Sunday celebrates Father's Day, so we'll be recognizing that in our service as well. I want to jump right into some of the prayers that I received this week by email and phone calls. I'd like you to join me in that spirit of prayer, if you will. First, I'd like to pray for Mary DeVries' best friend, Katie was just diagnosed with stage 2 breast cancer. May God's Spirit guide her through all the decisions that need to be made regarding her treatment. And especially may a spirit of peace ground her family as they navigate the reception of this news and coming to terms with this diagnosis. Our prayers also are lifted for a friend of Susan Moore named Anne who lives in Seattle. Anne has recently been hospitalized, and while she is home now, she's very weak. So may God's healing spirit fill her in this difficult time. We lift up the many UCC mission co-workers who are serving in Israel, Palestine, and the strife that they navigate every day in order to create peace, reconciliation, and hope in a region that has struggled to truly maintain any of that. May a spirit of unity overwhelm the divisiveness, enabling progress toward a society that works for all people. We're recording this service on uh, Friday, June 19th, and so along with millions of others, we honor today Juneteenth, a day that commemorates the ending of slavery in this nation. While we have a long way to go to build a just society, may we stay focused on that work and with new vitality and intention. And for those of us who haven't heard much about Juneteenth in the past, maybe for some of us, this is the first year we've noticed it. We pray for the eyes the eyes to see better and attend better to the voices and the experiences of all people who make up this great nation, especially the voices and the experiences of people of color. I would invite you in this time to take a moment of silence and you might lift, out, lift up prayers verbally where you are or just hold them in your heart and then in a moment, I'll lead us in a pastoral prayer, and we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. God, in these days that, that can make our heads spin, these times where we're often not sure what to say or do, how to greet each other, where we can go, what might change tomorrow. Our prayer is simply that we be given what we need today, what we need that will fill us in the physical ways, but emotional, spiritual ways, what we need that will guide us and hold us to give us a sense of centeredness in a time where it feels like we're all spinning wildly. May this worship service be an act of centering. May it bring us closer to who we really are and what we're called to do and be. In the spirit of faith and hope, we offer you these words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I'd invite
invite you to remain in the spirit of prayer while I offer this reflection for Father's Day. You know, we long for the protection that a father gives, for arms that encircle us, that, that hold us tight to a chest so we can hear a beating heart, arms that, that might toss us into the air, screaming with laughter and maybe even just a little bit of fear, even though we know that those arms will always catch us. From the moment we take our first breath, we long for that vision of a father. We long for a father who sacrifices, who lays down his time to play games, maybe read our favorite book one more time, or take a long walk just to, to listen. Maybe a father who reaches into his pocket and pulls out a $5 bill to go get some ice cream, who, who reaches even deeper to provide a good home good food, and good gifts. We long for a father who protects and who cheers and who sacrifices. And some of us are blessed to find bits and pieces of these longings met in human form. Like sun through stained glass. It's a, it's a brilliant picture illuminated by, by you, God, the one who satisfies deeply all of these longings. And we thank you, God, for fathers who protect and who encourage and their strong words and strong convictions that they teach us, fathers who are willing to sacrifice and who, who strive to love. But some of us are grieving, grieving the loss of a, of a wonderful father or the lack of one. Some never knew their father's arms. And some bear scars on skin and soul, dealt from a father's swinging arms. At some point, all of us are left longing, lacking. No human father can perfectly satisfy, and that's where you come in, God. So lean into us, enfold us, bring us life and light that we might hear your heart beating unstoppable love for us. Today, we celebrate all the fatherhood that blesses us, and we give thanks for the longing as much as we give thanks for the love. Amen. The song we're presenting to you today is not your typical church song, but it is one I have wanted to do for some time because it's got such a powerful message, and I'm excited to be able to uh, have the creative wherewithal uh, and a band here to, that we can present this to you. It's a song by Pink Floyd, and it's called On the Turning Away. On the turning away From the paling down front We won't understand Don't accept that what's happening Is just a case of others suffering Or you'll find that you're joining in The turning away It's a sin that somehow Light is changing to shadow and casting its shroud over all that we've known. Unaware how the ranks have grown, driven on by a heart of stone. We could find that we're all alone in the dream of the proud. Feel the new winds of 
chapter 2, verses 8 to 13. You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak, and so act, as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So the letter of James actually opens up with a revolutionary statement. He writes, I am James, a servant of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you might be thinking, okay, what's so revolutionary about that? In our modern understanding, it does kind of seem like just an innocuous introduction. But when James uses that phrase, our Lord Jesus Christ, he's making a political statement. It's, what he's doing is he's, he's, it's this protest against the status quo, a rebuke of the world that sought to grant that title, the title of Lord, to only one person. And that person was Caesar. To use that term the way James did was to put his neck on the line. Now in James' day, when the Roman army would march through the cities and the towns, they would carry before them a standard which would have written on it many languages, all of which said in one way or another that, that Caesar was Lord and Savior. And what James was doing at the outset of this letter was much more than just this perfunctory religious talk. It was a radical statement that Jesus was his Lord, not Caesar. Now, I know a lot of us were raised in churches that professed that if, you, if we proclaim Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, we would be saved. We would be granted entry into the pearly gates of heaven. And I, now, I wasn't raised in a church like that, but a lot of us have heard that. And I also know that a lot of us, and, and I'm part of this group too, we, we've learned that faith and, and following Jesus and being saved isn't really about avoiding some mythological place like hell and earning our golden ticket to heaven, okay? To be saved means to become fully alive. To find salvation means that we finally come to see the world as Jesus sees it. And James has figured this out, and he realizes now there's no going back. No matter how dangerous it might be to proclaim Jesus as his Lord, 
and not Caesar. James has named something, has seen something that he can't unspeak or unsee. It's out there, it's real. And once it's through the, the, the Jesus' eyes that he starts to see, never again will he allow his own eyes to betray him. Now sure, he might lose a lot. He might lose his livelihood because of saying stuff like this. He might be in danger of being, well, ridiculed, uh, imprisoned, tortured, worse. He might be told just to get back in line there before you, uh, you know, pipe down before you find yourself in real trouble, mister. But none of that matters. Because what he's doing is he's refusing to let fear control the way he sees the world. Because he's seen things too clearly to do that now. He's doing what that Jackson Brown song that Richard sang last week was talking about. He's standing in the breach. In that space between life as it is, what we call reality, and then life as it could be, or maybe as it ought to be. And in that breach, on that border, in that line between reality and possibility, that's where the cross was placed. I mean, right there, smack in the middle. It's there that Jesus becomes one with all those who have suffered, the ones who were beaten or murdered, humiliated, or told that they were less than. It's right there that Jesus becomes one with those who have no power, who are run over by the system, who are treated like they don't count, like they don't matter. And he shows the world that even horror and death and degradation, they don't have the final word. They won't win. They will never win when it's love that steps into that breach. And that, my friends, is why we have crosses in our sanctuary. It's why it's in our houses. Heck, it's why they're in our bathrooms, for that matter. We have them in our spaces to remind us how, how, how set up, not to remind us how set apart from the world we are, like we're in some special insider's club. They're there to bring us into union with the world, to be in solidarity, that we might see the world like Jesus does. The cross is in all those places, not to be some kind of decoration, but as a recognition that all the spaces, all the world is a breach into which we're called. And we're not called there to dominate or destroy it, but to serve and to act out of what James then calls the royal rule of love, which simply means love your neighbor as yourself. We're called to those places where, where the cross is, where the breach is, to be agents of love and service between where the world is and where it could be. And look, I'll admit, I don't always like standing in those places. When we're there, it means... We see the world in its ugliness and its weakness. We'll see where we've failed or fallen short. And I don't know about you, but I don't like doing that. I don't want to be, I don't like feeling vulnerable, especially in front of other people. I mean, this past Tuesday, we started a six session conversation on race and white privilege. And it was powerful, but it was also tough because it involves seeing yourself and your reality with new eyes. And for a long time, I've been so loath to look at it. I didn't want to engage some of the messier, difficult conversations on race and power and access and privilege. And it, it, partly it's because I knew deep down that once I saw, I could never unsee. I could never pretend that the way things are are the way that they should be. And I have to say, as we engaged that first conversation, as we opened ourselves to the kind of the mess and the mistakes and the challenges of seeing and discussing racism and white privilege, you could feel something rising. And it was this courage that was rising in the room. Because as we were all opening up, opening up about our blind spots and our painful experiences, our shortcomings where we'd messed up, where we'd missed it, as we held them in that space, Without judgment, we could feel this energy coalescing towards something, something like what James was talking about, that Jesus was always talking about. And it's funny because what it felt like in that room is that when we were all listening and being open and messy and vulnerable with each other, suddenly things got clearer. Suddenly we had all this new perspective on things that we take for granted, rights, opportunities, uh, access to power, the freedom to be who we are. 
I remember preaching a sermon at the first church where I served in the midst of the months long conversation and movement that we took toward becoming an open and affirming church there. And, and in it, uh, in the sermon, I talked about why I supported same-sex marriage. And, and this was at the time when civil unions were, were legal, but they didn't provide all the rights and privileges that married people have. So I was talking about why, at that point, I was in support of same-sex marriage over civil unions. And, and as soon as I mentioned, I got up to preach, as soon as I mentioned the word same-sex marriage, there was a man in the congregation who I knew to be a vocal opponent of all of that, and he let out this audible sigh, and he kind of just muttered under his breath something like that, oh, do we have to hear about these people again? And I managed to catch up with him after church just briefly, and I said, I, I want to tell you why this matters to me, where I'm coming from. And, and I brought up how I worked at a hospice in San Francisco, Laguna Honda Hospital, and, and how many patients we had there who were dying of AIDS. And while the rules of the hospice were much more open I heard so many stories from men who were not allowed to see their life partners when they got sick or when they were dying in a hospital simply because they weren't married. And I said to him, you know, that reason by itself is enough to make me want to support same-sex marriage because no one should have to go through that. And as I remember, he, he wasn't convinced. I don't think he stayed with the church very long after that. And that church eventually did vote to become open and affirming, to, to celebrate the rights of gay and lesbian and transgender people to be loved and accepted and welcome, and, and eventually to be married and to enjoy the rights that so many of us take for granted. I think that's, we, got, we always have to stand in that breach to see and to act with the eyes of Jesus. In those kind of places, you know, between what is and, and what should be. There was a tendency, though, in James' day to, to sort of sidle up to the powerful, you know, to kind of pay attention to the important people, the influential ones. You know, you heard the way the text said it. It said, love your neighbor as yourself, but there's some of you who are showing some partiality. As if, I don't know, maybe by spending time with big wigs and beautiful people, they felt like a little bit of that would rub off on them. I mean, clearly... What was true in James' time is not really that much different now, 2,000 years later. So true that, you know, in our world, you know, in our churches today, we, we shout out, love your neighbor as yourself, but then somehow we forget. And then we start leaning towards the ones that have the power, that, and we give their lives and their experiences more value. Or, or maybe we just look the other way or pretend not to hear, or pat ourselves on the back for what we are doing to lend a hand to help our neighbor. But today, there are hundreds of thousands of voices who are calling for all of us to listen and let that rule of love that James and Jesus talk about be made real, to let that equality that God desires be made real. And yeah, the idea of loving your neighbor, simple, okay, we get that. But the work of changing structures and systems and laws, that's complex, it's messy, okay? It, it will be and it has been a struggle. But the goal is clear. And the ideal is right in front of us. Let the love of one another be our guide in every single thing. You know, when I was in seminary, I was a part of a team that helped prospective students discern whether or not seminary was the right fit for them, the right choice. And so we would host these prospective student weekends uh, so that we had the chance to really get to know these prospects and, and, and talk about their faith and their motivations for getting on board. And I'll always remember this one guy, probably in his mid-30s, I think his name was Jack. And he had this dog-eared copy of a popular book from that day called uh, The Prayer of Jabez. And he told me how he used to be an addict and he made all kinds of bad choices in his life. But ever since he had read that book and he had given his life to Jesus, everything was better. He had stopped the drugs and the drinking. He was making better choices. He was fired up and he was excited to share his faith with the world. So he gets through telling me all those ways that Jesus has made such an impact in, in his life. And I asked him, Hey, that's really cool. But why exactly do you want to go to seminary then? 
He said, without hesitating, well, I want to share my faith. I mean, I want to learn more about Jesus. I want to receive more of those blessings. And I said, look, that, that's awesome. I'm psyched for you. I, I love that Jesus has made a huge difference in your life. But beyond that personal difference, beyond what it means to you, what is it that, that, that Jesus is calling you to do? I mean, if Jesus was here right now, what do you think he'd be doing? And finally, Jack stopped and he realized that his faith and his enthusiasm were all about him and his life and his journey. And look, there's nothing wrong with that. That's part of the way that faith grows in us. But at that point, it was kind of all that he'd considered. And the questions of what does it mean and, and where might Jesus be leading us? Where does Jesus call us to serve? These things he hadn't really considered. So if Jesus were here today, where, where would he be? What would he lead you to do? Would he be partial to the powerful or hang out with the well-heeled? Would he be inclined toward the influential? Or would he be marching for equal rights and justice? working in the forgotten places with the forsaken people to offer love, dignity, mercy. The royal rule of love that James talks about invites us to see the world through the eyes of Jesus, to utilize our faith and hope, not just for ourselves, not just for our families or our little tight circle of friends, but for the whole community, the broader the world. And right now, there are voices in the street calling to you and to me, urging us not to turn away, but to let Jesus' way, because after all, he is our Lord, right? But let that way guide us in all that we do so that our love, our faith, our hope, our enthusiasm will manifest for the benefit of all. Amen? Amen. Thank you once again for joining us for this virtual worship service. And now as you prepare to go out into the rest of your day, may you be guided by a sense of the presence of God. And may you be urged to see with the eyes of Jesus that you and your heart and your hands may not turn away. Go and be the hands and heart of Christ. Amen.